Hello, grade 12. I'm out for a walk to clear my head, stretch my legs, and to think about what I'm going to talk about in the upcoming screencast on the D-Day landings. And in the same way, you can take your learning outside, whether it's out in the back porch or if you want to go for a walk with the audiobooks for history or the screencasts, maybe considering as you look around uh, what you're going to answer in your discussions. For me, uh, with this topic, I was thinking that we know, or many of us know a lot about the D-Day landings from movies or popular culture, and so what, what are going to be some of the takeaways from this lecture that I'm going to, that I'm going to make? And I was thinking it might be something about the, just the sheer scale of it. The over 100,000 troops involved in the invasion, the thousands of aircraft being used, the hundreds of uh, troop ships and warships uh, being used on the invasion day, and uh, in addition, all the countless hours of planning, preparation, practice, all coming down to one moment in time and one event. Now remember, this event's not as important, I don't think, in the turning of the war as Stalingrad or Barbarossa. Oh, look, there's one of the closed trails. You can see the red sign behind, so a trail would normally go down, but I can't. Um, and what makes D-Day special, as I said, will be the planning and those operations. So for now, I'm going to finish my walk and I'll see you uh, back in the screencast. Hello, I'm back from my walk and ready to start the screencast. So let's go take a look at Operation Overlord. Operation Overlord D-Day in Normandy and the textual reference is 6.4. So this has often been memorialized in movies. Some of you may have seen Private Ryan. You definitely haven't seen The Longest Day, uh, which was a big movie in the 60s about Normandy. But it was a massive undertaking. And while not as big as, or as important rather, as Barbarossa or Stalingrad for determining the war, it still was a massive undertaking. And you can see here just how many different groups are involved. You can see in terms of aircraft, we've got almost 4,000 fighters, the gliders, air transport, the bombers to neutralize, tremendous amount of warships, uh, that includes huge battleships, uh, and those troop carriers bringing the troops. And then finally, of course, we have all those troops arriving, 23,000 by air, 1,500 tanks, and over 100,000 soldiers landing on five beaches. So a remarkable undertaking and the biggest seaborne invasion. Now, in terms of planning for D-Day, there were one of the reasons for, for having it was to open a second front to help Stalin, though, as you already know, uh, Stalin's already been taking on the majority of, his, of the war himself. Uh, another factor was that the, uh, the Western Allies couldn't attack Germany from Italy. That was just too difficult going through the mountains. So here's some of the questions they had, such as who would lead, where to land, uh, what lessons could they bring in from Dieppe and Anzio, how are some of these monumental logistical problems to be solved? Uh, what new techni technologies and techniques will they need? I think you know about the Hobart's funnies. And then finally, how do you hide an invasion of this magnitude? The first thing was who to lead, and that was the gentleman on the right, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, General Dwight Eisenhower. And the man on the left was the battlefield com commander, Montgomery or Monty, from uh, the fame with the Desert Rats. Now, in the Dieppe raid, been a raid in 1942 on a, on a fortified and, um, and an existing harbor, uh, and it was done as a test to see uh, if techniques would work and what could happen. And 6,000 Canadian and British troops attacked at Dieppe, 5,000 were Canadian, less than half returned. It was a complete disaster, uh, but one of the takeaways was they learned a tremendous amount about these kinds of seaborne um, invasions. The lessons from Dieppe in particular that they had included things like uh, the tanks would have trouble moving on the cobble beaches. Um, you had to have um, attacking on beaches rather than established ports so there'd be less defenses. You need to land the bulk of the tanks after the beaches are secure. These landing craft need to be improved and piloted by Navy personnel. And the final thing is you have to have complete air security, uh, superiority. And one thing I point to the bottom picture here that I'm circling is the seawall at Dieppe, and that became a death zone for a lot of soldiers as they couldn't uh, move over it, but yet uh, the defenders could fire machine guns and shell along the top. So where to attack? As you can see, the United Kingdom is being used as a staging area, and 
they would cross the English Channel. The closest area was here at Pas de Calais. Uh, you couldn't attack into the Netherlands, just the the um, just the situation there with the dikes and uh, all the areas could be flooded made that impossible. Uh, down this way, it was too uh, too far south, but an area that would look likely was an area of Normandy with many beaches, and uh, but still a long distance from England. So they weren't going to attack here, and they decided they would attack here. And the plan for attack looked like this. You had the airborne troops landing on one side, other airborne troops landing here, stopping the German reinforcements from coming in, and then you had the five landing beaches. And the one that figures so largely in Canadian history is this one, where the Canadians landed as, in a sense, their own national entity. So the plan, and here we have uh, Eisenhower talking to paratroopers on the, uh, the night before the invasion. Um, and he was a leader of unusual talent in the sense that he had, he was adept at logistics, strategy, and diplomacy. The plan was to have five landing beaches, those three drop zones I mentioned, and one of the big complications was three branches of three national armies, all communicating, all cooperating, and all working together. Uh, things you need to know about national armies and branches are that one branch may use one way of uh, determining locations on a, uh, on a map, whereas another one rather than UTMs, which you might have in the military, uh, the infantry rather, in terms of the uh, Navy, they might be using a latitude and longitude. So just, just things like that make it quite difficult. Um, they were going to have to gather um, information on the defenses and fortifications, and they'd have to scout both the Pas de Calais and in Normandy, so not to tip their hand. They're going to have to have a material buildup, um, such as in food, oil, uh, spare parts, uh, before the invasion and to supply the invasion. And then finally, they had to keep the whole operation and location uh, the landing secret. So the secret, one important act, aspect there was disinformation and Operation Fortitude, which involved having fake invasion plans for several areas in Europe. Uh, they even had a leader of this fake U.S. Army they set up. That was General Patton, who was seen as the uh, most aggressive and most effective American battlefield commander. Uh, they had a whole fake U.S. Army, they had fake tanks so that the Germans did ha happen to break through the air cover across England. They would take pictures of, um, of whole army encampments. Uh, they had whole sets of fake radio transmissions going on. And then the Allies, who did a marvelous job at finding German agents in England, had also, also made great use of double agents to feed false information back to, um, back to Hitler. There were practices in the landing. In fact, Operation Tiger was uh, a landing practice that happened with American troops. There's pictures at the top and the bottom of that. And uh, it was actually uh, intercepted by some um, German e-boats. And there was actually a, a major loss of life uh, that was kept secret to keep morale up. Um, but one soldier was, was quoted in saying that the, the, uh, the landings of Operation Tiger were much more difficult than the actual landings on D-Day. Uh, another aspect of the practice was to have live ammunition training to get the troops ready for uh, what they'd be facing. Now, some of those logistical solutions they had, since there were no harbors or landing area, just beaches, the solution was to bring in mulberries. That was the code name, just like tanks or water barrels have been the code, na code name of uh, armored fighting vehicles. And the solution was to bring those in. They had barrier ships that they put down along the outside, and then the mulberries were laid, laid down here and they were giant floating docks that then they sank so they could create a harbor to supply these hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Another problem was they needed to supply oil to the invading forces. So they had two pipelines that they designed to set up. The second one would be later, and it was running across. That's it today, you can see the size of it. And in fact, the pumping station was right here, and they uh, concealed that as a family golf course. So again, many levels of deception because they couldn't have uh, the German defenders uh, realizing what was going to happen. Now, in terms of some of the problems of what they'd face in the beaches, they'd face mines. So they had uh, this device built up, where, which would flail the ground and blow up the mines ahead of the tank uh, in order to bring tanks in with the landing craft that then could have help on the shore. There were these tanks, the DD tanks, not Donald Duck, as you might think, but in fact, duplex drive. And here's a picture of one on D-Day uh, assisting ground troops as they move inland. So they did succeed. Some of them were swamped, uh, but other ones did help. A selection of some of other Hobart's funnies are an armored um, 
bulldozer to to clear shell holes and improve conditions on the beaches uh, for going across ditches or if they need bridges they had the bridge laying tanks and then finally for attacking some of the fortifications they had um, Churchill tanks that were modified to be flamethrowers now the Germans uh, waiting for this Allied attack were actually um, divided in their strategies and what we found was that Field Marshal uh, Rundstedt wanted a defense in depth and uh, which would have had a large force of tanks being kept further back from wherever the Allies were going to attack and then the tanks would be rushed forward uh, to push them back. Rommel Helen, the ever however, who would fought in North Africa, was fearful of the air superiority that the Allies had by this time, and he wanted the uh, tanks close to them on the beaches. And in fact, he was right to worry about the, uh, the air cover, because on Sword Beach, a German counterattack was beaten back by the air. Now, Hitler uh, intervened, and he decided that he would split the tank forces between the two leaders, and then he commanded, because he knew best, that the reserve tank force could only be used on his order. And what you can see are pictures on the right here. Uh, the top picture is defenses laid out to prevent landing craft uh, coming in. If they came in at high tide, which the Germans thought they would, they would hit those and uh, capsize. If the landing craft came in at low tide, the soldiers would have further to travel on the beaches to be shot at. There are machine guns set up, and they're either in larger gun emplacements. Now, the invasion. There's going to be an airborne attack and a beach attack. Oh, wait, we almost forgot one of the most important men for this whole invasion. And that is... They needed a combination of the right uh, moon, tide, timings for the morning landings, and good weather. So the meteorologist and his team, that's James Martin Stagg, were critical in both the success of this landing and also in the deception. What were the conditions they needed? They needed a full moon. They it would help for the aircraft pilots. It would also have the highest tides. They also needed pretty high um, uh, a cloud cover so that the pilots could see what they're bombing and attacking. The landings uh, were timed to begin shortly before dawn, midway between high and low tide with the tide coming in, and uh, which would give the men not too far to travel, but would allow them to see the obstacles. On June 4th, the tentative invasion day, there was bad weather and so they had to they had to delay and um, the meteorologist confirmed that the weather wouldn't be great but that June 6 would be okay and with the next possible dates being when everything came together June 18th and 20th turns out it stormed on the 18th and 20th now the 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 Germans who did not have the weather collection they could have in the North Atlantic that the Allies did could not predict the weather as well, and so they predicted stormy weather for two weeks around June 6th, and that meant that, for example, uh, Rommel was in um, at the headquarters arguing with Hitler for more support. Now, this bad weather, I do have a reading about this. The bad weather was such, for the infantry, in boats, bucking a stormy English channel, the last few hours before landing were a misery of seasick seasickness. To quote Sergeant E.D. Chandler of the North Nova Scotia Highlanders, I didn't care if the whole German army was on that beach. All I wanted was to get my feet on dry land. And I continue. But the bad weather helped the Allied cause. Alexander McKee wrote in Cannes, Anvil of Victory, the Germans expected a landing at the Pas de Calais. But the invaders were steering for Normandy. They were expected at high tide and would land at low. They were expected in calm weather and not when the breakers were roaring on the beaches. German meteorologists had concluded there'd be no invasion for at least two weeks, and most German commanders accepted that. But as you know, the Allies went ahead. So this is what came at the beaches on the day. Tremendous amount of um, soldiers and men, and it turns out that their deception was perfect and the surprise was complete. As I read, German intelligence said Field Marshal von Wilhelm Kittel, knew nothing of the real state of the Allies' preparations. The full alert was not ordered even when the Allied invasion fleet was approaching the Normandy coast. Said General Montgomery, we attained a degree of surprise greater than we could have ever imagined. Remember, he's the commander of the ground forces. 
The landing craft rocket LCR above made its debut on D-Day. You can see a picture of that. They're flying rockets from the landing craft. Okay. Many of the men in the small craft were seasick. Said an order from 3rd Canadian Division Headquarters, seasickness. Alleviation, one hour before embarking, each man will be seen to take one seasickness tablet. Personnel should be sick into vomit bags, of which three are issued to each officer and other rank. The tops of vomit bags will be folded over after use, and the bags will be thrown over the leeward side of the crest. Anyone who's been seasick here, and I have, uh, knows that three bags may not be enough, especially on a long crossing. Now, the invasion of the airborne attack, the paratroopers were dropped. There were dispersions just because of the heavy anti-aircraft fire. And they not only came down as paratroopers in the dark, but the glider pilots also landed uh, in those uh, gliders. And as one glider soldier reported, they were told just to grab onto their straps, lift their feet, and just pray that they landed. The beach attack here, we can see from a landing craft, the soldiers jumped out. In some cases it was over their heads. Often it wasn't, and in the movie Private Ryan, actually, one of the actors almost died. Uh, Tom Hanks sa saved him, for real, uh, because he lied about being able to swim. And these attacks, as they came in, turned into this. This is later in the day in D-Day. You can see the large landing craft that are bringing those, the, uh, the, the uh, vehicles ashore, the loads of trucks. And here's an account of what it could be like. Now, while the casualties were lighter than they might have expected, it would... And here's an account from the landings for one of the soldiers. As the soldier of the Winnipeg Rifles said, the first section of the boat, everybody was hit. The second section, all but one. The third section out, but all but two. CSM Wilf Berry, Canadian Scottish wrote, we started with 138 men, and at the end of the day, we had 62 left. Lieutenant John Kasarevich, Winnipeg Rifles, I think we went in with 163. There were less than 30 by noon. So while the losses weren't as high as been feared, in, for some boats and some units, it still was quite high. So that was Operation Overlord, Day 1, the D-Day invasions. A tremendous success for the Allies with huge planning, huge preparations, and not a measure of a little bit of good luck. After the landings and as the forces swept forward, there were moments for the civilians and the Canadians to speak. But before then, we're going to talk about day one overlord. Just look at that. Scattered airborne troops, tough fighting in Omaha Beach. That's where the Americans were. And what you can see here is just a summary of everything that I've mentioned. And um, in addition, the Allied Deception Plan, Operation Fortitude, which I mentioned before, convinced the OKW and Hitler that Normandy was a feint, and the main Allied landings would come later in the Pas de Calais region. 15th Army was held there. Such was the success of Fortitude that many units were kept away from the Normandy battlefield until July, which really helped the Allies in their landing. And in fact, on the morning of the invasion, uh, they wouldn't go to wake Hitler up to release the tanks. Now, once the fighting passed, soldiers were able to speak. And uh, early in the invasion, probably in the first day or two, a Canadian reporter reported the following about some uh, Canadian soldiers. And I'll leave you with this reading. And the reading's called, Hey, mon gars! Pardon my French. As the first French-speaking war correspondent to land, this is Marcel Ouillemont, I was looking for the first meeting between a Frenchman and one of our boys. A white-haired Frenchman named Martin noticed a soldier with Regiment de la Chaudière shoulder patches. Hey, mon gars, he asked. Qu'est-ce que c'est la Chaudière? Chaudière, to him, meant boiler or furnace. C'est un rêve. De par chez nous, said the soldier, a river back home. And where was home? Moi, monsieur, je viens de Trois Pistoles. And where was that? On the banks of the St. Lawrence. Au Canada? Oui. Then, Monsieur Martin asked, allez-vous à Paris? Are you going to Paris? The chaudière had been warned to be careful with that kind of question. He shrugged. It's, and he answered in French, and it sounded like, tête bain, qui? Tet bien que non, a contraction of the peut-être bien que oui, peut-être bien que non, which means maybe yes, maybe no. But Normandy, it's not pronounced peut-être bien que oui, peut-être bien que non. It's also tet bien que oui, tet bien que non, a pronunciation carried to Canada by our Norman ancestors centuries ago. At that, 
Monsieur Martin grabbed the soldier by the neck, kissed him on both cheeks, and said, Look, my friend, you're not Canadian. You're a Frenchman like me. This ends the presentation.